on collaboration. I think we all know that there's no one single group that can address all the governance challenges, and especially at the urban level. Um, when you want to accomplish a project, there are a plethora of different st stakeholders involved. On disclosure, um, I'd like to focus your attention um, on uh, public contracting. This is a figure um, every single year the governments around the world, they spent $9.5 trillion on public contracts. And according to the EU, 10 to 25% of these money would end up into the pocket of the corrupted. And those are unaccounted for. Those are the money who are misappropriated. Those are the money who are lo that are lost. So how can we make sure that there are some transparency mechanisms built into these contracting processes? The goal of open contracting partnership is really to build norms and build um, global best practices for disclosure of the terms of contract, be it from the public sector or from the private sector, and to build the capacity for civil society members, for media members, and for parliamentarians to really understand and monitor the terms of the contract. And altogether, it would ensure services to flow with those, to those who are in need. Um, there's a, some positive development on, on that front in Ghana. So we, co we convened a stakeholder group called the Ghana Contract Monitoring Group, which is comprised of private sector, public sector, and civil society stakeholders. The goal of this group is to track every single award, contract award, that the government has issued. So the investor general, he um, chose to investigate two of the dubious contracts, and the results show that one of the contract was serious delayed for three years. Uh, the, the initial intention for, uh, for the completion was only one year. And, this, and the second uh, investigation showed that one of the bridge um, construction project deliberately ignored the need for the disabled, uh, the need for those who are traveling on foot. Basically, that was a bridge um, project, and there was no ped ped pedestrian lanes. So these were all stopped, uh, these um, uh, male practices were stopped before they reached uh, the final destination. So um, on participation, um, I think we would all agree that the, the basic concept is on citizen-centric governance. And one way to operationalize this principle is to, to use um, ICT-enabled solutions. This revolution of um, information, communications, technology really transformed the way that we communicate, the way that we learn, and the way that we do business. And for some, the ICT revolution can really lead to more empowered and more informed citizens. And for others, it can lead to better services and, and better infrastructure development. Um, let's take a look at how pervasive the mobile phones has been. And these are the, some of the recent data from, from the bank. As you can see, in some countries, there are more, more uh, mobile phone sub subscriptions than population. And if you aggregate all of these uh, data together, you can see the global mobile cellular phone penetration is about 96%. And according to, this is uh, 2013 data, I think, if, uh, according to some other uh, sources, uh, the number of global mobile phone subscriptions have already exceeded the global population. And I think the global population is about 7.1 billion people, or right now there are 6.8 billion people who have, um, who have access to mobile phones. And not surprisingly, half of those people reside in the Asia-Pacific region. And in China and India alone, there are 2 billion mobile phone subscriptions. But I like to juxtapose two figures together for you to consider. The, uh, this, this circle in, in, in blue is the percentage of global population with internet access. Two thirds of the global population still don't have access, yet a lot of the civil, uh, civil society citizen participation mechanisms are done through online um, uh, modes. So I, I, I'd like to, for you to think more of a balanced perspective about offline and online engagements. Let me give you an example from Brazil. So this is a, a program that we've done in the state, uh, in the southern state called Grande do Sol. The, the initiative is called Governor Asks. Basically, we encourage citizens to submit policy proposals using their mobile phone and to help prioritize different uh, policy options and, 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 and make them um, 
cast their votes on the things that they think are, are most needed. So here are some of the results. There are about 11, billion, 11 million people living in that state, but so far, uh, for uh, over the past few months, um, 360,000 people have casted their votes, and there are a lot of policy proposals being submitted as well. And this program is particularly about um, um, health care. And you can see, after this direct channel was opened up, there's a lot of improvements in, in tangible delivery um, systems. For example, there's an increase in the allocation for primary health care by about 166%. There's more allocation for family health programs, and there's a lot of improvement um, around mobile emergency service spaces as well, and the list goes on. And that's, a lot of, that's what a lot of governments are doing. But Informing sometimes signifies a one-way communication. So citizens are actually at the receiving end, obtaining information passively, and it gets better when it, when it comes to consulting interventions, because there's some interaction between the citizens and the government, but still consulting um, can lack of more of a long-term perspective, and there's no long-term monitoring aspect built into these initiatives. So uh, the ultimate goal for citizen participation in, is to really empower citizens to get involved in the decision-making processes.